Hello and welcome. I'm Bayless Conley, and I want to talk to you for a few minutes about overturning hopelessness. I run into people all the time that seem to have lost their hope. We've gone through some very dark and difficult days, but God has answers for us. We're going to get into the Word. I'm going to share a few stories with you, and uh, hopefully we will see hopelessness go out the window and faith arise in Jesus' name. Hi, I'm Bayless Conley. In life, we all face uncertainty, whether it's financial troubles, relationship valleys, a health crisis, or just trying to discover your purpose. One thing is for certain, God sees you. He loves you, and no matter what you're facing, He has the answers. Today, we're coming to you from the coastline of Southern California. As our new TV studio is currently under construction, we're bringing our filming outside and giving you some of the beauty of the Pacific Coast. Now, here's Bayless. I don't know if you caught the last or the, the, the first installment of this particular message, but I've been talking about overturning hopelessness. And just by quick way of review, there's two things that I spoke about before if we want to overturn hopelessness and uh, the, the absolute dismay that it can bring to our lives is number one, you need to hear because hope comes by hearing just like faith comes by hearing. Endeavor to find some books, listen to a podcast, hear some stories about how God worked in someone else's life and most importantly, get into the Word of God, read the stories about God's faithfulness, read about God's promises. We read that hope comes through the Scriptures and my friend, when you get into the Word of God, it is supernatural. It's able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. And the Word of God and, and the truth of God's promises will overturn the lie of hopelessness. And then after that, we, we talked about another aspect, that there are options. God always has a pathway for us to walk. The book of James says, faith without corresponding actions is dead. And, and just the, the truth is, is in your situation, whatever you're facing right now, However difficult and dark it may be, God has a pathway for you to walk. There are some actions that you can take. And when we begin to take those steps of faith, well, it, it overturns the confinement of hopelessness. And then I have a third thought that I want to share with you now, and it has to do with persistence. As we continue doing what we know is right, with confident expectation, we continue to demonstrate our faith well, my friend, that will overturn hopelessness as well. Persistence is really important. Listen to this, Galatians 6 and 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Persistence will overturn the paralysis of hopelessness. I remember listening, or actually I read this story once about a well-known preacher on the East Coast, and he was really known for his poise and, and the fact that he just, nothing seemed to perturb him or disturb him. And one day a friend came to visit him and he's pacing back and forth in his study like a caged lion. His friend was really surprised. It seemed out of character, you know, for this minister that was so, you know, poised and composed. He said, what's going on? He says, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. He said, I'm in a hurry and God's not. Well, friend, I've felt that way many a time. And sometimes you just have to continue doing good, do what you know to do, keep following the last instructions you've received from God, and, and just trust that He is working. He doesn't always work things according to our timetable. Have you ever found that out? I remember reading about Luciano Pavarotti, the famous Italian tenor. Um, when he was younger, his father was a baker. His father actually turned him on to music and to singing, and he loved it. And he had one of the local tenors there in, in his town in Italy, took him under his wing and began to teach him. But he also went to teaching college, and Pavarotti graduated from teaching college. And then he asked his father, says, Dad, what should I do with my life? Should I be a singer or should I be a teacher? And his father said, well, in life, you're generally given two chairs, but you need to choose one chair. It says, if you try and choose two, two, choose two chairs, you'll fall between them, but you need to find one chair to sit on. So 
Pavarotti chose the chair of singing, and he devoted himself to that. But from the time he made that decision, it was seven long years uh, of study and development and, and, you know, trying before he had his first professional appearance. And then it was another seven years after that before he finally made it to the Metropolitan Opera. Sometimes we think these people just sort of break on the scene like a bolt of lightning and we don't realize there was a whole pathway that they persistently walked day after day to get there. You know, some of the most famous missionaries, you know, in, in history and in the world had to labor a long time before they saw any converts or any fruit to their ministry. If, if you think about it, um, it was William Carey in India. Seven years he labored before he saw his first Hindu convert. Judson labored for seven years in Burma before he won his first convert. In West Africa, it was 14 years before the first person became a member of the church. By staying steady and continuing to express your faith in God, you break the paralysis, the, the paralytic effect of hopelessness. You know, if you've ever visited us here in Southern California, we, we have an amazing campus, Cottonwood Church. We, we've been blessed. We have a 33 and a half acre campus. We've got an auditorium that seats 3,400 people. We have another auditorium that you can put 1,200 in. We got another auditorium you seat 900 in. We have another whole building that's dedicated to children's ministry. And it's just, a, it's, it's a marvelous thing. And some people walk on campus and say, wow, look what God has done. And I agree. Praise God, look what he has done. But you know, we've been at this for almost 40 years. We've been putting one foot in front of the other and we have fought some titanic battles. This isn't the first facility that we built. We've had some huge struggles along the way. And with this one in particular, you know, I, I found these, these parcels of property that were, you know, vacant. And there was four different owners that lived in different places in the country, six different parcels. And I found out that the underlying zoning allowed a church. And I went to the city and talked to them and did my best to find out who the owners were and where they lived and how to contact them. And everyone said it was impossible. It took us a year, but we got all of the owners to agree and sell. So now we've got, it was like an 18 and a half acre piece of property. And we, we joined them all together. And then we worked on plans for another year, you know, to, to build a church building there. Work closely with the city. And then we turned the plans in. It's been two years of, of struggle and trying and, and encouraging people to give and to get on board. And, Three days after turning in those plans to build, I got a letter from the city's redevelopment agency. And they said, we're taking your property away from you. And if you don't sell it to us immediately, and they basically wanted it for a song and a dance, far less than it was worth. If you don't sell it to us immediately, if you don't capitulate, we are going to lock you out of your property. We'll enact eminent domain and take your property away from you. And they did. They locked us out of our property, enacted eminent domain. And if, of course, we fought back. It went into a legal battle that went for years and years and years. I mean, years. The, the local media didn't treat us well. And basically, it, it became a, a national story. It was carried from the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, or the Sacramento Bee here in California the LA Times and, and every paper coast to coast covered it. it on any given Sunday we, we'd walk up and ABC or CBS would be there with their cameras wanting to get a story and no one well I'll take that back one small local paper there was one reporter there that treated us fairly but no one else did and literally in fact our own local paper in town every week there was an article in there about our church that was filled with misinformation and lies. And I would open the paper, sometimes there'd be a satirical cartoon with my face on it. One day I had a devil's horns and a devil tail in the satirical cartoon they'd done. And man, they treated us poorly. And we were in court for so long, lies were told in court about us and against us. And eventually, after years and years of fighting, it ended up in federal court. 
And when the ruling came down, the judge ruled in our favor in all five counts, and it was found out that they had lied and that they had expunged records. And, you know, the judge said everything that the city redevelopment agency doing was wrong. And so, you know, we, we've won, but now we have to deal with basically some of the same people in trying to get our permits to build. They can gum things up for years to come if they want to. And story, anyway, someone had bought another piece of property that was right nearby, offered to sell us some there. We ended up selling our property, you know, to the city and uh, did it for a, a fair price. And long story short, we ended up now with 33 and a half acres instead of 18 and a half acres. And we were able to build this marvelous facility. But listen, from the time we first engaged that property until the time we moved in, it was nine years. I'm gonna let that soak in. It was nine years of one foot in front of the other, nine years of trusting God, nine years of dealing with difficult things. And friend, if you're gonna overturn the, this paralysis of, of hopelessness, and hopelessness wants to get you to sit there and do nothing, you just have to continue day after day, whether it feels good or doesn't feel good, whether it seems like the sun is shining and God is there, or it seems like he's not there, you need to continue doing what's right because in due season, you will reap if you don't lose heart and if you don't faint. And I just wanna encourage you, I know there's someone watching me right now. You know, you, you've been having a rough go of it when it comes to relationships. Maybe somebody at work has lied about you and you become the butt of certain jokes. Maybe you have not been promoted like you should have been. Maybe you've lost positions. Listen, God sees that. You just keep a, a good spirit. Don't talk bad about other people. You just keep your heart clean and you do what you know is right. You keep giving 100%. Work as unto the Lord, the scripture says, even if your boss, your employer is unfair. My friend, promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. It comes from God. And when he opens a door for you, no one can shut it. Put your trust in him and continue to do what's right. Continue to persevere. You know, it was by perseverance that the snail reached the ark. And I just want to encourage you, you keep doing what's right. You keep doing what you know is good. And when the story's all done, I believe you're gonna end out on top. In Jesus' name. The final thought I wanna share with you is simply enter his gates with praise. I'm gonna tell you why I say that. And that's actually taken from Psalm 100 and verse four. It says, enter his, and his means God's, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. So you, you, you've heard, you, you've heard someone else's story about how God helped them. Faith is maybe rekindled in your, your heart. You've listened to the word of God, you, you've read a, God's promises and the stories of how he faithfully helped people in every generation. You, you've prayed and God showed you some action you can take and you faithfully continued to do that. You've got the mindset that says, all right, as long as this takes, I, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm not going to give up. Well, all that's left at this point is just to praise him and to thank him. Praise overturns the attitude that accompanies hopelessness. And that attitude that accompanies hopelessness is dull, lethargic, dark, and it's heavy. You know, I, I have a, a friend that is so negative. I mean, everything, doesn't matter what the subject is, he looks on the dark side of things. Doesn't matter what's going on, he's just, just down about it. I mean, to the point, and, and I love the guy, but I dread being with him because it's just like he pulls you down and it, you try and encourage him and he, he spins it and puts this negative, you know, slant on things. And, and truly, when, whenever I've spent time with him, at, at the end of that time, I feel absolutely, utterly drained. 
He's just like this walking cloud of despondency. You know, you get in someone's presence and it, and it can drag you down if they're a very down person. But you know what? You get into somebody's presence that is up and that is cheery and that is positive, that affects you in a positive way. One of the pastors on our staff, one of my dearest friends, but he's also one of the happiest people I've ever met. Doesn't matter what's going on, he's up. I've only seen him down a couple of times in the you know, last 25 years. Um, I've only seen him discouraged and it only lasted for a little time. And I just love being around him and so does everyone else because what's on him just sort of gets off on you. And why I say, you know, all that's left is to enter God's, you know, courts and, and into his, his gates with praise and thanksgiving is because it brings you into God's presence. And my friend, when you get into God's presence through praise, it changes things. There's something very uplifting about his presence. There, there, there's something very positive about being in God's presence. And, and there are times that I believe we can experience his presence in a tangible way. Not that it's about feelings, but there's times you just know that you know that you know God is there and praise brings that on, that on. Psalm 22 says of God that he inhabits the praises of his people. Literally, he enthrones himself upon the praises of his people. In Isaiah 60, I believe chapter 64 and verse 5, you have to check, see whether I'm right, but I'm pretty sure it's Isaiah 64 and 5. Speaking of God, it says, God, you meet the one who rejoices. Literally, when we praise God, when we lift our hands, it brings his presence. And when his presence comes, darkness goes. I had a friend ring me up one day. And uh, I've known this guy since I was in high school. We've been friends for a long, long time. And uh, he's a believer. And he just, he called me up and said, Bay, I messed up. And he'd, he'd done something really, really stupid. Gotten himself in a situation, says, I don't know what I'm going to do. Man, my life is over. You know, I can't believe I did something so stupid. What am I going to do? And I mean, he was just like talking. He's on the ledge. You know, he's wanting to jump. And, you know, what he did was really stupid and really out of character. And it did land him in a mess. And I said, well, bro, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I don't have an answer specifically, but I, I, I do have this to tell you. And I know if you do it, it'll change things. I said, you need to walk your living room floor and start praising God really loud. I told him that on the phone. I said, you need to lift your hands and start praising God loud. You need to fill your house with his praise and start thanking him for his faithfulness. He said, okay, I'll do it. Hung up the phone. Talked to him the next day. He said, you know, I started doing what you said. I was alone in the house. I lifted my hands and I started shouting and thanking God and praising him. And I Felt like an idiot. Felt like there was lead weights tied to my hands, but I kept doing it five minutes, 10 minutes. I'm pacing back and forth just saying, Jesus, I love you. I know you care for me and I praise you. I thank you that you're good. I thank you that you're faithful. He said, I continue doing it. He said, and suddenly something broke off of me. It's like that heaviness was suddenly shattered and I sensed God's presence and I had hope. It came up in my heart. And, and I just been, continued to praise him, continued to praise him. And he said, and I sensed his presence. And he said, when I got quiet, he said, the Holy Spirit whispered to my heart. And I knew what I'm, I'm supposed, he said, I know what I'm supposed to do now, Bayless. I know what I'm supposed to do. And you know what? He followed that, that pathway that the Holy Spirit showed him. And what, what we both thought was going to be the end turned out to be the beginning. God did something so miraculous in his life. He is a blessed man because he followed what God told him what to do. God turned seeming defeat into an amazing victory, and it came through praise. You know, I remember one time we had, uh, uh, I say we, I, my wife didn't do it. I had done it. I had, I'd made a business deal on a handshake. This guy had come really highly recommended by a, a close friend of mine, someone I trusted, 
and said, Bay, you can trust this guy, man, just go for it. And so I committed myself just on a handshake and the guy didn't fulfill his end of the bargain. And he put me in a terrible place financially. I mean, it was a place I didn't have a way to get out of it. And I tend to be a pretty even keeled guy. I don't have big, you know, upward, you know, movements and I don't have, you know, big downward movements. I just stay pretty steady all the time. But I went into a tailspin. I just saw no way out. It was like, okay, we're financially ruined. We're liable to lose everything we have. You know, what an idiot I am. You know, I did this thing on a handshake and, you know, didn't get this guy to sign any papers. And, and you know, I, I don't think he honestly did it on purpose. I think maybe what he was counting on didn't show up for him and he just sort of passed it on to me. And my wife knew things were bad because I didn't talk to her for a couple days. She knew I was in trouble. And one morning I went out and I sat on the curb in front of my house and I just said, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, well, you just ought to do what you preach. I thought, I didn't want to hear that. What do you tell me that for? But I knew what he meant. You know, I was, I'm up in the pulpit, you know, I'm preaching, hey, you're going through a rough patch, you need to praise God when everything's going wrong, you need to praise him. And I thought, I didn't want to hear that. But I knew I needed to do it. So I, I started walking up and down in the street in front of my house. I lifted my hands up and just started praising God out loud. And I know it was loud because a few days later, one of my, my neighbors teased me about it. <laughs> they could hear me all over the neighborhood, but I didn't care. And I'm walking up and down, and you know what? The same thing that happened, my friend happened to me. Something just broke off of me, and I had hope. And, and within a few days, I'm going to call it a miracle. Something happened that I didn't see coming that, that got us out of that, that mess. I just didn't think it was possible, and God worked it out. I want to tell you, friend, it pays to worship God. And that, that, that attitude of of despondency and hopelessness is almost like a shroud that accompanies a hopeless attitude. But you know, the Bible says in Isaiah 63 or 61 in verse three, it talks about putting on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And some of you watching me right now, listen, all you need to do is change your clothes. You need to take off that, that spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of Praise. Just change coats and things will change for you. So in this little series where we've been talking about overturning hopelessness, and man, it's a message we need in this day. A lot of people are without hope. Here's some ways to overturn it. We need to hear. We need to, to listen to other people's stories, search them out, and listen to people when they talk about God helping them. And we need to get into the Word and see God's promises and read about how He's helped other people. And then we need to realize there's options. God has a pathway for us to walk. There's something that we can do. There's an act of faith that we can take. And then we need to be persistent and just carry on doing what we know is right, doing that good thing and just stay in it for the long haul. And finally, we need to enter his gates with praise. Hearing overturns the lie of hopelessness. Realizing there's options overturns the confinement of hopelessness. Persistence overturns the paralysis of hopelessness. And entering God's courts with praise overturns the attitude that so often accompanies hopelessness. And I just want to tell you in the remaining few seconds I have, listen, you may not have anyone in your world that tells you this, but I'm going to tell you, you are loved. You're loved by God. He loves you more than you have the ability to understand it. You might say, well, Bayless, you wouldn't tell me that if you knew what I've been up to or you knew the things I'd, I've done. Listen, he loves you anyway. Nothing catches him by surprise and you are loved by God. And the only word I could use to describe his love for you would be fierce. And you need to believe it. My friend, love never fails. You have a God in heaven that knows your name. He knows you, he knows your circumstance and he wants to help you and give you a future and give you a hope.
My friend, if you are new to our programs, I want to say welcome. We, we do our best to, to try and share something that'll help you, something significant. And uh, I pray that, that the words that I've shared have found a home in your heart. You, you are beloved of God and He wants to help you. He wants to guide you. And I just pray that the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your heart will be flooded with light and you would come to know Jesus in a personal way. And as I do many times, I want to take a moment and thank those that, that pray for us. And we couldn't do what we do without your prayers. And I want to thank those that financially support what we do. We actually take these, these, these sessions, these broadcasts, translate them to different languages around the world, put them in the languages of the people in more than 100 countries. And it's only because people give and financially support us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. May God richly bless you for doing so. You know, we always go through different things in life. We always have besetting circumstances. The storms of life come to everyone. But in the midst of those storms, there is hope. God always has an answer for us. He always has a pathway for us to walk. And I have a special gift that we want to get into your hands called There Is Always Hope. It's a bundle of, of messages that will be a blessing to you. In whatever circumstance you're going through, they will bring you hope. I hope that you get it. God wants to get your hopes up, way up, or maybe the hopes of a loved one. Along with two hope-inspiring CD messages, this bundle includes a booklet with Bayless' amazing story of how God completely turned his life around, setting him free from years of addiction and confusion. Call or order online now. Just use the information on your screen and be encouraged. There is always hope.